Welcome into the latest edition of ESPN FC. I'm Dan Thomas, joined in the studio today by Stevie Nicol. We've got real live soccer to talk about as, of course, the Premier League kicked off today. Don and Frank will be joining us later on to reflect on Arsenal's victory over Crystal Palace. But we'll kick things off with the defending champions in Germany. Bayern Munich taking on Eintracht Frankfurt, an absolute sellout for the opening game of the season. Fantastic scenes here. And, uh, well, it would just take five minutes for Bayern to open the scoring. Kimmich with the goal. Well, I hope the goalkeeper blames the fog or whatever that is because this is atrocious goalkeeping. Leaves his near post and gets done. That was a flare that was sent off. Five minutes later, Bayern make it 2-0. Yeah, Pava just ball bouncing around, comes out to him and he just smashes it home. This was a crazy first half. It was like a basketball game and it was a, it was one end and the other end we saw here. Then Tuta heading this, off the crossbar. Could have changed the game a little, but unfortunately for Tuta, it did come off the bar. <laughs> and then what about this for a chance? Bayern on the break. It falls to Muller oh, off the post of his head. I still can't believe he didn't score. <laughs> I mean, it's not the greatest of pass from Nabry, and Muller gets too far ahead of it. It's just comical, actually. I, it, it, there was just a comical element also to all the yeah. game. Lindstrom here does everything right until the finish. Yeah, I, again, it's it's a it's a horrible finish. He's, he should have gone the other way because there's nothing to shoot at that way. Sadio Mane, of course, starting his first game for Bayern. An opportunity here. Well, the goal actually does well. This strike comes off Muller. Goalkeeper reacts. He pushes it onto the crossbar. Moments Manny. later, though, Manny would get his first goal for Bayern. Lovely build-up play here. Lovely build-up play. Horrible defending. Nice little ball to, to Manny. And that's a great header. Just picks his spot. Keeper has no chance. Yeah, Gnabry just playing it in at the near post. More goals in would still come in this first half. Ten minutes to go. Musiala makes it 4-0. Yeah, that's how you like them. Couple of yards out. Probably a little ball from Muller. Easy finish. And then with two minutes remaining in the opening period, it's a chance and it's taken by Gnabry to make it five. Yeah, goalie gets an arm on it, but can't stop it going in the net. And just ridiculous. Speaking of ridiculous, yeah. what about this from Neuer? <laughs> just tries to be too clever. Shin to win, comes off his shin. Uh, into the 83rd normal minute, service. exactly. Normal service is resumed. Sani finds Musi Oliver his second goal of the game. Yeah, cutting through that defence once again. Good feet, good awareness, just rolls it home with the keeper going the wrong way. Uh, so a dream start uh, for Mane and indeed for Bayern Munich, the defence of their title. So let's get some reaction now, shall we? As Archie Arna and Lutz caught up with Musiala after the match. Jamal, hi. Welcome into ESPN. Do join hi. us here. So we've just been praising you about your dribbling ability, your ability to find pockets of spaces. So the simple question now, you just got to tell us how you do it. Yeah, it's not, it's not easy to explain. I think we have a, a good team. We, have, we know how to position ourselves very well. I think I try to go in the half spaces, like you say, and then if I have the chance to turn and then attack the defensive line, that's what I try to do, and I think that's what I do best. Is it? Perfect, perfect. Yeah, good. Yeah. All good. Uh, just to, just to emphasise as well, your dribbling ability, where does that come from? Were you somebody who was playing a lot of cage football when you were younger? Where exactly does that come from? Because we don't see many who are able to glide past players like you do. I think since uh, early early ages, I was uh, practicing just tight uh, dribbling in tight spaces. It was just in the garden or in training through cones. That's mostly what I worked on. I wasn't like on the cages every day or something. That's what I tried to do mostly in training and in games all the, all the years. And I feel like over over time, you you know what works for you, and then you can implement it into the game. Um, how much communication does it need for you and also for your teammates? Because to me, it always looks like uh, 
Serge is going up high. You drop deep a little bit, so you create those pockets. One goes deep, one goes up high. How much do you communicate and how much is automated already? Yes, it's, it's important because you can't crowd the spaces. Because, uh, like, like I said, in the half spaces, I need to turn and then attack. So we can't be crowded two players in that same space. So if one goes out, the other comes inside. Or if one goes, then it's just all of rotation. We have to keep an eye on each other. The stadium's very loud, so you can't talk with each other that much. You just have to look everyone, hand signals, and then try and move synchronized. And were you surprised already how easy it was kind of scoring goals against Leipzig and today as well against Frankfurt? Yeah, we're, we're creating lots of chances. We're playing very good football. We have control over the game. I feel like if we're keeping the ball a lot and not conceding a lot of chances as well, then we have more time in front to take our time, create, and just everything, and just have our fun, and then we'll create chances and score lots of goals. Lutz. Yeah, it just looked today a little bit like actually it was Cones, uh, the Eindracht players, the way we went through them, but honest all my questions. So I have another one. <laughs> um, Sorry. How actually do you feel uh, playing with, uh, with Sergio Mane? How does it feel uh, actually playing off him? Does he give you lots of spaces to run into? Does it make you feel comfortable to play next to him? Yeah, he's he's been on the top level for many, many years. There's lots of stuff I can learn from him. I'm, I'm just trying to play off him as best as I can because he's going to create his magic himself as well. We just have to look uh, after each other and see and go off each other what works best and, and keep keep an eye on him where he goes so we can move the best to create most of the chances. There has been, or there is now in this squad, as there always is at Bayern, a ton of competition for places, particularly in the attacking areas, and that hits you, obviously. What has Julian Nagelsmann said to you about earning a consistent place in the team and what you have to do? Yeah, I think this goes uh, for everyone. I think you just have to keep uh, doing your work and training and, and games to to get your, to keep your spot in the, in the team, and that's what everyone's trying to do. I think anyone can go out in the starting at 11 and perform with all the quality we have on this team and it's just whoever goes out there and starting 11 has to just give it their all and I think that's what every player does. And is there anything that he said to you that he wants he wants more from you in, in any area of your game at all because we see on the touchline he's still prowling about at 6-1 and he, he looks angry still. <laughs> yeah I mean you can you can always do more and he always pushes us to to do that extra more not to drop our level even though we're like 5-0 up or something. It's, it's important I think what he spoke to me about because we all have the offensive qualities but we need to keep on that defensive work rate as well because that makes the whole game easier if we if we lose the ball to press and win the ball up higher because then we can create more chances of that as well and one one other question so did you have any changes in the preseason considering the world cup in the winter or yeah. was it like like always the same procedure yeah uh, I think this was like my proper first preseason. I think uh, it was a bit shorter, our time off. I think usually you get a little bit more time off. So we came in a bit earlier, but I feel like the procedure was pretty much the same. We, our preseason pre tour would be longer if we didn't have the World Cup. But other than that, how hard we trained and everything was, I'd say, was the same. Yeah. And a word on maybe a, a hidden hero of mine, Dino Topmuller. I believe he's the one in charge of the set pieces at the club. Was he responsible for Joshua Kimmich's free kick there at the start? Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, blank out there. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah, we always go, go through them. He, he always comes with new ideas and how we can be creative uh, on the set pieces because every, every chance uh, is important. And three kicks like that decide the game. Maybe if he didn't score that, then the game would have been different. So every chance like that, we just have to be creative. He gives us uh, opportunities and plans, and we just decide on the pitch what we... Uh, Go with it. <laughs> hey, you've been speaking to us for a very long time, Jamal. We appreciate it. Just finally, yeah. what would you call this result tonight in terms of a message to the league? What was it? Yeah, I think it was. Uh, I don't have one word right now in my head. It doesn't have to be one word. It can <laughs> yeah. be sentences. I think uh, we're we're good, good in form right now. We want to keep this up. We're not going to underestimate every any opponent. We have to go in with the same energy into every every single game and if we play like this we're going to be very hard to stop well i think this guy has shares yes, in for you sure because of the amount he's talking about you right now as well <laughs> so you want to thank him in particular jamal thank, <laughs> thank you sure. very much thank you. for joining us on espn uh, more from the guys in the moment what a great environment for a 19 year old to awesome. blossom big time i mean best team best players 
I mean, the coaching staff are obviously, they know what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, you can't not learn when you're in, the, in that sort of company. Right. And doing it day in and day out. It's, unless you shut yourself off, unless you have the wrong attitude, unless, unless you become big headed about it. But if you stay grounded and humble and open to learn, then you can't not you can't not learn playing with with people like like Manley. Can he put in Lewandowski numbers? Um, no. Right. I don't. I don't. <laughs> Listen. I think sometimes we forget there there are very few Lewandowskis um, around, <laughs> and to try and and to try and even think you're going to do that would be the wrong thing to do, right. particularly with a young player. So forget about that. Be yourself and do the best you can at all times, and it'll come. Uh, let's go back to Frankfurt, shall we, and get some uh, reaction from the guys on the result overall. Thank you, Dan. We were expecting a cracking game here in Frankfurt, and it was. It just happened to be a very one-sided one for Bayern Munich. Anna Friedrich and Lutz van Enstiel joining me here. Anna, what are your overriding impressions after that performance tonight from Bayern? We did see many goals, so this is, <laughs> this is a good thing. Honestly, I didn't expect Bayern Munich to be that strong and on the other hand, Eintracht Frankfurt to be that weak because the first 20 minutes they were really, really lousy. Um, they defended um, naive, I would call it this way. Bayern, on the other hand, was very sharp. They started off with uh, two set pieces and after that they just like destroyed them. We saw as well Joshua Kimmich running over to their set piece coach Dino Topmuller to celebrate with him because he gave he gave the instruction that Lutz, uh, Kevin Trapp might like to stand off his line a little bit. But the, the freak thing with that goal is that you could barely see what was going on because of the smoke. Yeah, I think it was difficult for us to see where we were sitting, but I believe that uh, keeper Trapp saw the ball 100%, otherwise the referee who is right in there would have not really give the ball free. However, I think uh, that goal changed definitely the momentum of the game. Very early, a goal basically coming out of nowhere, and Frankfurt never really got over that shock. You know, Bayern Munich started to cruise, and looking at this whole 90 minutes, it was dominating, it was entertaining, and it just shows us that Bayern Munich plays a bit of a different football now and RG two games played 11 goals scored think about that one should contextualize as well the smoke was there because of the pyrotechnics let off by the Frankfurt fans behind the goal but we saw some on-field pyrotechnics from the Bayern forward line the flexibility of that line as a defender Arno how would you be feeling facing the likes of Sadio Mane Serge Gnabry right now I wouldn't be too amused to be honest <laughs> so I agree with Lutz so there is definitely a momentum but even though, even if he would have not like gotten this goal um, through the set piece, they would still destroy them. Because to me, the lineup that uh, Glasner chose in the beginning wasn't the best. Uh, with Rode as a center mid, he was way too slow to to hold uh, Musiala. He was always just like outrunning him. And in general, Bayern Munich was like one or two um, levels too strong tonight for Frankfurt. They were more like passive. Bayern Munich was so sharp. I didn't expect them so sharp. I, I thought that it would be the other way around, especially playing here in front of your home crowd, that you would give everything, especially in the first 15 minutes. We should address Eintracht Frankfurt. Let's not forget, they won the Europa League only back in May. Their fans were singing about it loudly and proudly at the start of the game. And funnily enough, looks the noise about that went down after, I think it was about the fourth goal tonight. Surely their coach, Oliver Glasner, did so well last season, he has to react in the first half because he just left his team out there to be slaughtered with no changes. Yeah, I think he was brought caught pretty cold like anybody else, I think, on the field or in the stadium. You know, looking at Frankfurt's transfer period, they signed really good players. I think they have a, maybe a better team than they had actually last season, but in the EuroLeague, they had a good start into the cup as well. So I think they came in with a lot of confidence. Their confidence was gone within a few minutes. Uh, they didn't defend very well. They were slow in the back line. I think the distances between, the space between the lines was terrible. And then when you have these quick players, now we didn't see Coman, we didn't see Sané in the first half, we had four other players up there, that speed just absolutely killed them. But let's find something positive too, so the second half, so obviously Bayern Munich took off uh, the foot of the, uh, the gas a little bit. On the other hand, we saw the new striker of Frankfurt, Kolomuani. He did very well, he's a strong player, he's very 
strong physically, he's fast, he can score, he showed that as well. He made some slight changes in the back, Kostic um, went one up uh, in the midfield and Lenz uh, got back in the, in the, on, as a left winger. On the other hand, Rode uh, got substituted. So there were some changes, I think, so after criticizing him uh, with his uh, uh, first 11, but the second half, obviously, it was a little bit more exciting. But I think we can add there also, you know, losing an opening game against Bayern, that happened to the best. It's it's something uh, we don't have to count on, but it's very likely. Now it all depends on the reaction. How can they react next week? Will they come out and actually shake it off and play the normal football they can play? Or will they still have that disaster in their heads? That's not, I think it's a tough week for the coaching staff, for the players to get over that. But believe in their strengths. And I still think Frankfurt have a good opportunity to confirm that Euroleague win with a good performance in the Bundesliga. Today the better team won. Frankfurt had a day off. 6-1 I think just confirms all that what I said. Lutz, Arna, thank you very much for joining us. Arna has loved seeing Jamal Musiala here tonight. The star of the game, two goals. For Bayern, things are looking very rosy. For right track Frankfurt, Dan, next up in the UEFA Super Cup, Real Madrid. No problems, Al. <laughs> Well, I love the way that Arno was trying to put a positive spin on it. <laughs> Fair play. Um, as they say, kind of, it was just a terrible start, obviously, for Eintracht Frankfurt. How much blame should Trapp get for this goal? All of it. It's all down to the goalkeeper. It's all down to the goalkeeper. 100%. Yeah. I mean, he's basically, he's basically telling Kimmich to stick it in the back of the net. Right. You've left That's the, still some finish, though, isn't it? Oh, yes. No, listen, let, not, don't take away from the finish. It's on target, it's got pace, he brings it from outside to in, but the opportunity shouldn't have been there. Right. The goalkeeper has to be at least another step this way. And what happens is, Dan, if the goalkeeper's in the correct starting position, it takes the option away from the, the man on the ball, which was Kimmich. But the fact that he's moved too far right. opens that whole thing up and gives them a target. So 100%, this is down to the goalkeeper. What would you give Sadio Mane out of 10 for today's performance? Um, yeah, eight or nine. I mean, he didn't, he didn't have to try particularly hard. It was really easy. He scored a goal. He was involved in, in the build-ups to, to some of the, particularly, I mean, the they scored six, but they, had, they could have scored ten. They really could, couldn't they? So, no, it was a fantastic day for, for Sadio Mane. Not the best day for the Bundesliga, though. No, I think, unfortunately, all the questions about how is Lewandowski's departure going to affect the outcome of this championship, we're kind of sitting here now going, well, it feels as though it might be done again. Uh, the Bundesliga, though, continues, of course, uh, this uh, weekend. Uh, the big game is the, the late one, isn't it? Uh, Borussia Dortmund in action against Bayer Leverkusen. And just a reminder, every single game will be live for you on ESPN+. about survival once again for Khadif uh, this season and just a reminder we are not long now away from the start of La Liga once again here on ESPN plus every single game will be available for you Khadif kick off their campaign at home against Real Sociedad meanwhile before that of course it's Barcelona against Rio uh, the big story with Barcelona today well two big stories really Robert Lewandowski was unveiled to the fans a great reception at the camp now but also Always with Barcelona, there's a story, there's a subplot, there's a problem. And the problem that they have at the moment is La, La, La Liga have said, Robert Lewandowski and those other signings that you have made, including Dembele, cannot be registered as players. 
They need to find more money to be able to do that. But Barca say, don't worry, we've got a fourth lever uh, that we're going to pull, which means basically that these players will be registered. It should be fine for the start of the new season next weekend. Barcelona is the ultimate soap opera and it just continues with something going on every single day. And just a reminder, you can keep up to date with the latest goings on at Barca on our YouTube channel. And if you haven't done so yet, be sure to go to ESPN FC and subscribe. Well, of course, the Premier League season kicking off with Crystal Palace taking on Arsenal. Arsenal winning the game by two goals to nil. Martinelli would open the scoring in the 20th minute. Arsenal then rode their luck. However, a late own goal after a Saka shot saw Arsenal take all three points and I suppose go top of the table as well. For more on this, let's welcome in, shall we? Frank LeBeouf and Don Hutchinson are with us. Don, overall, 2-0 flatter Arsenal, is that fair? I think it is fair because I think you're right, Dan, in your analysis there where they were sort of hanging on at about the hour mark. I thought they were really lively first 20 minutes. I thought Jesus looked incredibly sharp after the three seasons that he's had. And then all of a sudden you can sort of, the lads will know, you get to, you've done all your pre-season work, you get to about an hour, you start to blow, you start to feel it. Uh, and then Crystal Palace, I thought, had a good little spell. And then the, the Gerhi own goal, the second goal, killed them really then. From Arteta's point of view, Saliba played well, new signing Zinchenko, Jesus, as I said, looked really sharp. You sit there on a Friday night, that's why the TV companies picked the game, because they smelt an upset, they smelt really. Palace could have nicked points off Arsenal, so Arteta sleeping well tonight after a 2-0 win, clean sheet. Yeah, very much so, Stevie, yeah? Yeah, considering how badly they started last season, yep. um, getting the win, regardless of how you play, is probably the most important thing. Uh, I thought they were the best side. Uh, there wasn't much in it, which kind of tells me that they're not a top four side. Yes, they're better than Palace, who are a mid-table team, right? And they're only just better than Palace, so it kind of looks as though, certainly judging from this game, we're kind of going to get the same Arsenal as we got last year. A team that will do well at times, but ultimately won't get in the top four. Not not on this performance. Saliba looked good at the back, Frank. Yeah, they did. Well, we have to say that Ramsdale made two very good saves, one in the first half and the second one with Eze, where I think Eze should have done better. Uh, but uh, overall, yes, I found Saliba very well settled with Gabriel uh, in, the, in the central defence. And uh, we have to see if, if uh, White is really in good position on the, on the right, and, uh, right hand side. But I have to say that Zivchenko brings something different, that mm. Tierney will see... Uh, how was out that deals with, uh, with the two of them. Uh, but I found, yeah, defensively that they were already spot on, much better than last season, for sure. So for me, it was, uh, yeah, a fair result, I think. What would you give Gabriel Jesus, mark out of 10, Don, his debut? Um, I think you're looking at an eight and a half. I thought he was exceptional. Wow. Um, I thought he looked really sharp. He was a nightmare for the Palace defenders, closing them down. He was... A little bit unlucky when he'd done some good work in the second half and he played it into Martin Odegaard, who then tried to play it to Martinelli instead of shooting. So, you know, the minutes that he's got in the bank leading up to this game, it's all about the first Premier League game because you are still blowing. You can do all the hard work you want. The lads will tell you. When you go into that first Premier League game, it is tough. And he looked really, really good. I thought when they got him the ball, he looked good. No. He, he kind of disappeared out of the game, but I think that was more to do with the fact that his team couldn't get him the ball. We saw right from the get-go, Arsenal were, were fantastic out of the block. Yeah, really good. Uh, and Jesus looked like, just, <laughs> he looked as though he was going to do something. Every, every time he got near the ball, he looked as though he was going to do something. So the amount of time that he spent on the ball, when he was on the ball, he looked really good. Yeah. But they're going to have to get him a lot more of the ball. That's, that's the big question. Frank? Yeah, well, I wouldn't give a nine and a half, you know, for to Jesus because he really disappeared the second half for me. But he, we have to be, I would say, fair, fair in a way that uh, is the beginning of the season. And I agree with the guys. The first half, he was outstanding. He should have scored, you know, when he dribbled, made an nutmeg, you know, in the first chance that he had, first chance that he had. It, 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 he made the difference when he was sharp physically, and it says a lot about uh, the, the fitness of the players. They're not ready yet. It's why maybe Arsenal went down a little bit and Crystal Palace mm. came back up. But, uh, but 
Overall, you know, Gabriel Jesus showed already the talent that he has and what he can bring to the Gunners, for sure. Stevie's saying, Don, that this sort of performance shows you why Arsenal won't make the top four. Do you get his point? No, I think Stevie's been a tad harsh because, you know, when you play that first game, Dan, it is hard. You're away from home. You know the opposition. Palace are a good side and they can stick it on you. They've got some fantastic players who've got loads of pace. I don't think I'd judge the whole season on this one performance because all you want is a win. You want a clean sheet, got that. Saliba played well. Zinchenko played well. Thomas Partey is critical. They've got to keep him fit. Keep him fit, they've got a right chance. So you go away from home on a Friday night and you stick three points on the board with a 2-0 win and a clean sheet. I think Stevie was a little bit harsh there, if I'm honest. Have you got them finishing top four then, Don? Have you changed your mind? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, fifth. <laughs> well, <I see. laughs> you walked into that one, Don. <laughs> uh, uh, that, of course, the game that kicks off the uh, Premier League season. More action to come at this weekend. The transfer window is still open until the end of the month, and it has been an interesting time for Chelsea over the last couple of days. Uh, obviously, adding some key players uh, to finish in the top four. They are 11 to 8 on. Frank, there's suggestions they are very close now to get for Fana for Leicester. It is a lot of money. I think it's over £80 million is what it might cost them to get that centre back. Do you think this is a good deal for Chelsea? It's not a good deal. It's a lot of money for a player who is not uh, international. But uh, if you see the the brightness already that the players have, you know, when he plays, every time he plays and what he can bring to Leicester. And uh, if you think about the future in the next 10 years, if he can stay at Chelsea and be the new, maybe John Terry at the back. Yes, of course, he can, uh, he can be uh, the good price for a promising talent. That's for sure is going to be a very, very, uh, a very good player very, very soon. And international also very soon. But, uh, you know, when you see that they are ready to pay 65 million for Cucurella, yeah, you know, it, I think it's a good price to get for Fana for 80. <laughs> you know, but uh, I guess they have lots. I guess they have lots of money. I have to. I have to calm down about Cucurella because people are gonna think that uh, that I don't like him. It's not the case. It's just I think Cucurella played for Getafe and uh, Brighton and 65 million for a player who is 24, played only like 30 games or 40 games in the Premier League. I think it's a lot. But uh, but it's nowadays, not your money, Frank. It's, it's okay. Uh, it's uh, crazy. No, that's all right. That's all right. I, I have no problem with that. He, he has more money than me. He has more hair than me. That's for sure. And uh, maybe he deserve all of that. But uh, I think uh, the world of football is getting crazy. And uh, at some point, they will have to come down, I think. But uh, if it's a, it's a plus, I'm happy to see Cucurella at Chelsea. Like, I would be very happy to see Fofana because I was the first fan of Cucurella on ESPN FC. You have to remind that to everybody. Oh, Frank, you definitely weren't. Uh, Don, what, what do you make? Let's talk about Fofana first. Uh, yeah. <laughs> is, a very is good a player. Good... Right, Yeah, go a good player, Dan. But it sort of, it, it doesn't really make sense to terms, in terms of the money that they're spending. You know, how can Kukurea be, be valued at £62 million and Raheem Sterling at 45 I know Koulibaly was probably going into the last year, he's contracted about 34 million, but 62 million for a 15 million pound left back. That's what Brighton paid for him. I think if you're a, if you're a selling club now and Chelsea come knocking on the door and you can literally stick any number you like because Todd Bowley and Chelsea are going to pay it. It's, the, the numbers are astronomical. Cucurella, Steve, you played at full back. I don't... <laughs> it's, not, it's not worth that. I know. I see Cucurella as... Playing for a team like Chelsea as the guy who can back up somebody. Right. I don't see Cucurella as a team that's looking to win the Champions League. I don't see him as the left back. Right. I don't. So does he come in like, back up to Chilwell then in your mind? Well, well yeah, but, but that would be 25 <laughs> million maybe. Right. Not 60 million. Yeah. I, it it kind of seems like the new owners are getting taken advantage of. Because you don't pay 83 million for a centre back unless they're the finished article. And for fans, for fans, for fans, not. He had a great first season. He stood out. He was injured last season. 
This guy's still learning his trade. Right. This guy's still learning the game. This guy's still got a lot of stuff, particularly positionally and decision making wise. I mean, that's what centre back football is about starting position and decision making more than anything else. And this guy's a novice in real terms as a professional at 21 years of age and what he's done in the Premier League as far as that's concerned. But he's now gone for 83 million to Chelsea. I, I'm sorry, that, that doesn't make sense. I think the owners have been taken advantage of both with Fafana and with Cucurella. How far is Fafana away, Frank, from being the finished article? Uh, well, that we don't know. I, uh, if he plays all season long and Chelsea goes far in the, in the Champions League, they, he's going to get the experience that he needs. But it, it was going to take like two, three years to be maybe at the top if he's talented. Um, l l look at uh, Thiago Silva. He needed to be 35 or 36 to win the Champions League. And he made some mistakes against Barcelona. He was already on, in his 30s. So we don't know the truth about whether a player is going to reach the top of his, uh, of his game, you know, at 28, 30 or 25. Um, the sooner the better if you pay him for 80, if you pay him 84, 85 million. But um, he's, he's nearby. I would say he's very close to, to be at the top, as, as Stevie said, you know. It takes a lot of things and a lot of details to reach it. I don't know, if he has a, an average season last season, he can go in doubts. And then, you know, it can break a little bit his, uh, his increasement and, uh, and, and, and we don't see him before like three, four years. And the Chelsea would have spent 85 million, which I don't hope for him. I really hope that he's going to be fantastic and the Chelsea will be very pleased and even say it's a, it's a bargain because they can sell it like 150 million to somebody else <laughs> later. Here's, here's his biggest test though. For Fana's biggest test is going to be making mistakes playing for Chelsea. Because when you're playing for Leicester, or you're playing for Southampton, or you're playing for, you know, there, there, there's a dozen teams in the Premier League yeah. that you gain experience with, your, your game grows, whilst you're making mistakes in games. You can get, you can, you can hide the mistakes when you're playing for these teams. Because it's not, there's not quite the focus. Right. People just look at you as a young player, you're coming along, blah, blah, blah. When you, when you step on the field for a Chelsea who are expected to be challenging for, for, for Champions League and challenging for Premier League, you don't, you don't get the opportunity to go and make mistakes without it being thrown down your neck right. by the papers, right. by people like us. By Especially with that price tag, isn't it? With that yeah. price tag. Yeah. So, so, you know, it, it can either, it can go two ways. It can either kill them. Or all of a sudden he finds this strength from somewhere and, and, and learns quickly. Uh, let's just remind you the business that Chelsea have done so far over the summer. Of course, Lukaku out on loan, going back to uh, Inter. You've got Rudiger going to Real Madrid, Christensen going to Barcelona. Uh, at the other side, you've got Cucurella coming in, Sterling Koulibaly as well. Uh, now, Thomas Tuchel was asked about the strategy around the transfers that have been made because there's suggestions that they just seem to be throwing darts at the moment. This is what Thomas Tuchel had to say in response to that. He said, panicking? No, I would describe it as super hard working and learning while new on the job. It's of course in reference to the new owners. What do you think, Don? I mean, he's right in what he's saying, but it doesn't feel right, does he? Where he's basically saying to the the new owner is learning on the job. Um, that seems a bit of a harsh statement, even though probably factual it's correct. And that's what I think leans towards Stevie's point where, and what we're saying is if you're a, if you're a selling club, you can stick any number on any one of your players because Todd Bowley and the, and the guys upstairs at the hierarchy will probably pay it. So essentially he is, you know, learning on the job. My worry for Chelsea, and that's why I haven't got them in the top three is, Where's the goals going to come from? I don't think right. Kai Havertz and Raheem Sterling are going to be the men that gets 20 plus goals. I have them down at between 10 and 15. So you start to worry, actually, where's their goal tally coming from? He got asked about Abamyang, who scored 79 goals for him when he was at Dortmund, and he didn't, he didn't mention Abamyang. He said, I could do the 79 goals. So I think he knows that his team are going to be shy. Frank, are you concerned at all? 
I'm, I'm still concerned offensively. I think right. they, they, they showed me defensively that they, they, they've done the job, you know, hiring Koulibaly, for example, that, and I'm pleased to see Ch uh, Chilwell and Rhys James uh, back into business. I think, uh, I think in, um, in defensive midfield, uh, uh, midfield zone, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the three that we have so far, Kante, George, uh, uh, Kovacic and, and Jorginho. But the, the main problem has been for Chelsea, the, the front line. And uh, it didn't resolve the problem. He got rid of uh, four years of one problem with uh, Lukaku. I thought, you know, Lewandowski would be the real target for, for them. Uh, but maybe Lewandowski didn't want to come. And uh, there was maybe a possibility, or is there still that possibility with Ronaldo? If it's possible, you know, and you think if you can get Ronaldo, I think you should get him. But I think Tuchel learned from Paris Saint-Germain that having a big star in the dressing room doesn't really suit him. So, so Chelsea kick off their game on Saturday uh, against uh, Everton. Uh, just a reminder, every day we stay late to answer your questions on Extra Time. Uh, you can check that out. Oh, sorry. Look at Ali. Green blue blaze, isn't it? <laughs> uh, you can check that out over on our YouTube channel. Ten Hag wasn't very happy today. Uh, he was asked about the Cristiano Ronaldo situation and he came out and he said, now I have to point out those who left, there were many players who left, but the spotlight is on Cristiano. That is not right. I think we've said enough on it. I said it's not correct. You mention it, you correct them, then move on. Inevitably, it doesn't matter how many players did it, because it's Cristiano Ronaldo, he's going to be under the spotlight. And what's going to be very interesting now, Stevie, is looking ahead to Sunday's game as to whether or not Ronaldo will start. Will he be on the bench? Will he be in the squad? Martial's injured, obviously. They're short up front. What's Ten Hag going to do? Well, I can't help thinking, going back to hmm. the five rules. Yep. Rule number one. I got, it's right at the top of my list. If you're late, you're not playing. Yep. How about... If you don't even train during pre-season with a team, <laughs> you can still play. So if you're late, you, you can't play. But if you don't even bother going to training and you miss the whole pre-season, you can still play. I mean, so <laughs> again, I said that at the time, you make rules, you're, you're, you're putting yourself on the line. And, and now he's put himself right on the line, Ten Hag. What do you think he'll do? Well, the fact that Martial's injured, yep. he's, he's, he's kind of maybe got no choice. Right. But at the same time, if he plays him, then that's what should, people should start, start questioning him. And Manchester United again. You've got Ten Hag now coming out and saying it's OK that players left. So why... No, he's, he not, didn't say it's OK. He said it's, it wasn't correct. Well, well, but it doesn't seem as though he's that bothered. Right. So if he was that bothered, he should be saying players shouldn't be leaving. So the fact he's now gone from Mr. Hard Guy with all these rules, that he's not, he's not saying anything about all these players leaving, now he's going to have to maybe play Cristiano, so all these rules are all out the window. So he's having an absolute shocker. Uh, it's not ideal, is it, Don? <laughs> for your first game in charge. No. Do you know, Dan, I thought... I thought this was the perfect opportunity when Ten Hag said this is unacceptable. Not just Ronaldo, but all of them. Because we know, Dan, there's no, there's no, there's no manual where it tells you you can't go at half-time. But we all know, know as pros, it's not the done thing. So Ronaldo was testing the manager. It was a statement from Ronaldo leaving. And maybe as he dragged some of the, the youngsters with him, Dalla, I think, was another one. But I thought this was a perfect chance for Ten Hag to say to Ronaldo and the, and the media and the watching world, it's unacceptable and he will be fined and others two weeks wages. It's almost just like Ten Hag's got this reputation of being a bit of a hard man and he wants it done his way, but yet his comments were a little bit bland and it was a little bit like it's unacceptable, but he might start at the weekend and it's not the end of the world. Well, it is the end of the world because <laughs> you're having a conflict and argument with the manager, player, player, manager he will probably end up starting Ronaldo, which is ludicrous, in my opinion. He'll probably start Rashford. I don't think when you miss a pre-season, how can you waltz straight back into Man United's first team on the opening day of the season? That doesn't sit right Dis with the discipline side of it because the manager's there to put these rules down. And if all of a sudden, match day one, he chucks them in the bin, then where does he go from there, Ten Hag? But, but he wants to win a match, Frank. 
Yeah, it was to win a match, yeah, and uh, and I guess he will need Ronaldo if he's fit enough to uh, to play. But let me translate his comment. I said it was unacceptable. I was expecting the ball to uh, back me up. It's not the case. I was said that. Uh, Ronaldo is the man <laughs> and uh, I wanted to play the tough guy when I first came like Tuchel did when he signed for Paris Saint-Germain and left after you know because he couldn't handle it because it's impossible and because Ronaldo for Manchester United is bigger than anybody else and everybody knows that and nobody can do anything about that especially if the board doesn't back up Ten Hag so Ten Hag lost the war, not the battle, the war. It, it won't handle the dressing room anymore because the message has been sent. You can do whatever you want. So that's over. That's over. He's going to have to deal with Ronaldo and some others because uh, the board or the, some people above Ten Hag allowed that to happen. And that's what it is. And that's what is going to happen for the rest of his contract. Uh, it is then Manchester United against Brighton on uh, Sunday. Uh, the first full week of Premier League uh, matches, one of 38, of course. Uh, Saturday sees Fulham take on Liverpool. That's the early game. And then Sunday, Leicester, Brentford, United, Brighton and West Ham take on Manchester City as they defend, start the defence of their title. Uh, that is it. That brings us to the end of today's show. I'm smiling, Stephen, because we have a very special surprise for you in Extra Time. And you'll find out what it is as Extra Time is next. Frank and Don back with me to answer your questions. Welcome into the latest edition of Extra Time. Thank you, as always, for your questions. Frank and Don are with us, as is the man, the legend himself, Stevie Nichol. Let's see it. What? You've got to tell us what's going on in this video, Stevie. Absolutely brilliant. How you can, how you can watch this and not laugh is, is beyond me. Stevie, explain what's going on here is the first question. And here we go. <laughs> Where did you get that? <laughs> <laughs> Where did you get that from? <laughs> 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 oh, you never know, key kept that quiet, uh, did you? sent it to me. I'll tell you what. Look at that. What is that? What's he doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Look, I'm playing. I'm playing a game on the Oculus. Right. So there's all these balls. All these balls are coming at you in different areas. And you've got to hit them. I can't okay. believe. Okay. I, I can't. You, you have get, to. I, what, his hand. You have to. You know what? My thighs were killing. I, I can't believe you can get down that low, Stevie. No, no, Stevie, your knees are the up. same colour as the sofas, man. <laughs> 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 Uh, and what, what's do, the do, do you have to? Do you have to? Stevie, do you have to dress like that, or, or it's uh, you know somebody? You know. I'm my ca I'm casual in her. <laughs> and what's on your feet? Look at that. Uh, yeah, have got, got slippers on. Right. Have you got slippers and socks on? Aye. Why? Well, because I took yeah. my shoes off, <laughs> took my well, trainers off, and put my slippers on. Right. What so an outfit. Them. It's fantastic. Yeah, but take, isn't you, it? Take, take your socks mm. off. We're, <laughs> when you when you wear flip flop, don't wear socks. You know, at least. <laughs> it looks it looks like it's still the nineteen eighties. I was tired. Uh, My thighs were killing me after that. Brilliant. There we go. Very good, Stevie. Uh, thank you very much to Eleanor for, uh, for sending yeah, me I'll that. I've seen her one again. Yeah. Much appreciated. Um, obligatory percentage question for Don. The percentage chance that either Everton, Brentford, Fulham, or Leeds will be relegated after this season. Mm. Uh, Brentford, no. Well, I mean, percentage-wise, I don't know, because I think Everton without Calvert-Lewin are going to be in a spot of bother. Leeds right. could go down. Who's the other one? Fulham. Fulham. So them three are in it with Bournemouth. Right. So... Mm. How do I do a percentage out of that lot? <laughs> you can put four into a hundred. You can just put four into a hundred. Four into a hundred. Uh, you, you could just give me, yeah, a percentage for, for each one. Oh, I see. Uh, okay. Right, Brentford, zero. They'll be right. fine. Yeah. They'll be fine, absolutely fine. Then I think you're looking... <sighs> Everton, oh, dear me. <sighs> I think Fulham will go, so they're high. I think Leeds will go, and I think Bournemouth will go. Everton, just OK. So what percentage chance are Everton to go down? 
30. Ooh. Ooh. 30% is quite that high, is high. Yeah. Is it? So what's, the is rest it? that doesn't work out. Well, no, it's, it's not, not going to work out. No, no. It's got no that's players. not going to work out, dog. No, it doesn't have to add up to 100, does it? Because there's three well, places. Well, hold on a second. Right. So, he's saying that Everton... Right, the other teams get, have got gonna... more chance of going down than Everton. Yes. Right? Yes. So, if Everton's at 30, yes. then the other teams have got to be more than 30. Yes. So, how does that... Well, there's, three, there, there, there's three places, isn't it? You're not just going for one place. Oh, no, but he's throwing four, so there's three others. <laughs> and if Everton are on 30, the other shut, three... Steve, shut, Steve, there's only 70% left that. for the other three. You can't get away with that. And none of them can be lower than 30, <laughs> so that doesn't count. That, that's 90. 90 and 30 is 120. There you go. Right. Hey, on, detective. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, can, I, can count, I can do a lot of things, but... Uh, Frank, how much potential does Saliba have? Uh, a big one. I mean, I saw really, I, I, it signed like three years ago, I think, uh, for, for the Gunners. Never played a, a single game since. It's been on loan, I think, uh, uh, Saint Etienne, Nice, and then uh, Marcel last season. But really, last season, he made a huge step ahead of his, uh, what I think, of his potential. And uh, yes, today we saw already that he's ready. He's ready. To, to show all his talent, that he's going to be a real plus for Arsenal and uh, maybe the best player. And I really think he's already an international player. Didier Deschamps called him once. Uh, and I think he's going to be one of the stronger, strongest defender um, uh, within like two or three seasons. It's fast, like I've never seen a defender as being so fast. And uh, mm. he's hard, tough on the, t on the guy, knows how to tackle. We saw it today. Um, and very clever in anticipating, you know, runs from the others, covering his teammates. He has everything. Really, he has everything. Will he be as successful as Frank LeBeouf? It's going to be a hard task for him, and I wish him the best. <laughs> <laughs> That's a no. Uh, how does it feel, Don, going into the first game of a season? It can't be just another game. Have you ever dreaded going into the first game, knowing that it was going to be a long season for the team? No, I've never dreaded it. I've never, ever dreaded going into any first game. It's excitement, Dan. It's, it's what you live for. Um, they are hard, though. I remember going into the championship with West Ham and we, we played Preston away. And we, we went to Preston and it was absolutely boiling. It was like, it just felt like the hottest day on earth. You're away from home. Your legs have gone after about 20 minutes. You can't get enough water down you. You're sweating. You've got no energy. You've got sea legs on. You just, you can't find enough energy. You look at the clock and you think close to 45 and you're 20 minutes gone and it's a massive test. So you've just somehow, you've just somehow got to get through it, play well, stay injury free and try and take three points. That's all you can do. But I'd never, ever dread going into any game, never mind the opening day. It's, it's amazing, the opening day of the season. As a player, no. As a coach, oh my goodness. <laughs> the last season at the Rebs, going, into this, going into the season when you know you've not got a good team. Right. And there's nothing you can do about it. Right. Awful. It's a horrible feeling. I bet. You're just praying. Because your hands are tied, basically. You're praying. Yeah. <laughs> Frank? Yeah, it's funny because while the guy was uh, the guys were talking, I, I, I realized that I only remember the first game that I played for the club that I um, signed for. But after, I don't remember the beginning of the season for the next season that I played with them. So I remember right. our first game with Laval against Nice that I was really uh, uh, suffocating before the game. Uh, it was my first game ever. Uh, after with Strasbourg, I, I remember the first game uh, the, when we were promoted and we played against Lille. And um, that was a good game. The first game that I played for Chelsea, uh, yes, intense against Southampton. Intense because I discovered the fantastic atmosphere in the English football. And I had to slap myself to wake up because I was uh, watching the, what do you call the, uh, the Southampton, uh, the Saint Stadium. And, um, yes. and yeah. it was amazing, the atmosphere. I, and I had to slap myself to say, okay, wake up, now you have to play. <laughs> but I never... I never been scared of uh, of playing a game, and especially the first game. I was very um, impatient to start right. because you mm. want to play the game. You, it's it's your life.
It's our That would be the Dell. That would be the old St. Anson ground. Yeah. Um, for the boys, what's the? Oh, sorry. During the career, which player leaving your club during the transfer period actually made you feel sad? Was it because of what he brought to the locker room, your friendship on and off the pitch, or strictly because of his play on the pitch? Anyone make you feel sad, Steve? Do you know? I actually remember not not when they left. Right. So Ian Rush left Liverpool to go to Juventus. Yep. And the following year, around Christmas time, we were we were. I think it was around Christmas time or just after it. It'd be just after Christmas, and we were we were doing the Anfield rap. Right. Song. Yes. So it was basically a day out. Yep. And we were having a fantastic season. And Rushy was off. The Serie A was off for a break. Okay, winter break. And he came to to the place that we were making the record. Yeah. And of course, everybody had a few beers and the whole thing. And I just remember in the middle of one of the singing along, he was sat in the corner, and he was having a tough time at Juventus because, I mean, basically at that time, Italian football, if you played centre forward, you got one shot. Right. You got one pass. Yeah. You got one opportunity. And he was just sat in the corner, and I just remember looking across, and he just had a look on his face as, as if he wishes he was one of us. Yeah. And I just remember his face, and I felt bad for him. Um, tell, tell the Rushy story. Oh, when he signed for you, meant Rushy. So of course, he flies in a private jet, him and his wife and the agent, yeah. to Juventus to sign the papers. And Listen, at Liverpool, when MD signed, there was two men and a dog in the camera. <laughs> yeah. You know, regardless of who you were. <laughs> and so he had no idea what was waiting for him. So on the way over, and before he got on the plane, yep. he decided to have a couple of, uh, a couple of ref beers. refreshments, yep. shall we say. So by the time he actually got there, he was well, he was well oiled. Right? <laughs> anyway, so the plane comes down, lands, and they're coming down the, run the runway, and him and his wife are looking out the window, and there's about 10,000 people there, and he's like that. Ah. He's thinking, <laughs> what's this about? He's like, is there somebody, somebody else coming? And so the, the Italian guys went, no, no, this is, this is for you. And he's like, what? <laughs> anyway, so they get out of the plane, they come down, and of course all the cameras are there, and this reporter shoves a camera in his face, and shoves a mic in his face, and says, Mr. Raj, have you anything to say to the Juventus fans. And Rushy went, welcome. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Guys like that, what? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Um, what about you, Don? When someone left, did you feel sad? No, I was probably the one that was leaving. I can't yeah, no I one felt sad. <laughs> no, everyone was like, yeah, he's off. <laughs> yeah, that's it, oh, Don's gone. <laughs> Oh, what, about, days. what about you, Frank? Well, everybody would thought when Craig Burley left, you thought I was sad, but I, no, yeah. I, did not, no. I don't even remember it. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but parade, uh, yeah, yes. one player, one, play, <laughs> one player, uh, Jose Cobos, playing for Strasbourg and signed for Paris Saint Germain. We were like brothers, and when he signed, I was sad. Happy for right. him, but sad yeah. for myself. Uh, and after when uh, Flay was playing for Chelsea, when Steve Clark left, uh, yes, uh, uh, even if I was uh, playing with Michael Dubery and then Marcel Desailly came over and it was nice to add them, I felt something was different after him because right. he was really somebody special, somebody that I didn't know, a fantastic teammate uh, with a fantastic um, uh, behavior and mentality. So yeah, I was sad to see him leaving. Don, what's the worst berating, either behind closed doors or in front of the team that you've ever had from a manager? Oh, my days. I mean, we've all had millions of them. I mean, Harry Redknapp's given me a fair, fair few. Graham Sunes has given me a fair few. Right. Probably probably Harry, really, because me and Harry didn't really see eye to eye. Everything that Graham Sunes gave me was because Graham knew the game and he was honest and he secretly liked me. I remember, I remember Graham getting me in the office. I might have like told you this. <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll tell you a story which sums Graham up. And when I was at Liverpool, he used to be on me every single day, Dan, and he used to hammer me every single day, like literally every day. 
and it got to about sort of like three or four weeks and it was like it was just I just knew it was coming and I was a little bit paranoid but he was giving me it every single day and I went to see him and I knocked on the door and he opened the door and he sort of went in there and I went Gaffer can I have a, can I have a quick word and he went yeah yeah so I've gone like Gaffer like every single day am I, do, am I doing something wrong because every single day you're having a go at me you're on my case every single day and he come out with a line I went I'll, I'll never forget it he come out with a line he went the day I'm not on you is the day I don't care about you. Right. And it was basically saying he's on me every single day because he likes me and he wants me to do well. And then I can remember years later, I can remember, literally it was like, it was, it was ridiculous. Literally years later, I met West Ham and Mark Noble was just coming through the side and Mark pulled me, I was, I was a sort of senior player. And Mark Noble said to me, oh, she went, is there any chance of you not having a go at me? He went, every single day you're having a go at me. And I, and I, and I ushered the same line, exactly the same line that Graham Sooner said to me 10, 15 years ago. And it's just something that you pass on to the younger lads when you've got time for them, because you really, really like them. You want them to do well and not waste it. And I think that was a nice message from Graham. So Mark Noble's success is down to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. That's, that's that's, that's one. What we're getting from that. What about you, Stevie? Yeah. Thinking many, but I remember I remember I got one from Dal Gleish that, that came from nowhere. Right. I it was pre-season. We travelled to Bristol on the Friday night, which was a five and a half hour, maybe six hour journey. Right. We played on the Saturday. I got half my tooth knocked out, so I had a I had a nerve hanging out. Ooh. So I kept touching it with my tongue and I couldn't eat and the whole right. thing. So then we had another like six hours back on the bus on the Saturday. I was playing in a game in Glasgow with Alan Hansen on the Sunday, which was another four and a half hour drive to Glasgow. Played another game, had a few pints after the game. Mm -hmm. Another four and a half hours back. Yeah. So that's two games. Yeah. What, 18 hours in a bus or a car. And we had another game on the Monday, right. which was Phil Neal's testimonial. And because we'd played those two games in two days, Saturday, Sunday, the manager had said to both of us that, you know, he'd try not to play us on the Monday. So I, d I didn't play. I played the last 15 minutes. And I couldn't feel When I went on, I mean, it was a full house, Phil Neal's testimony against yeah. Everton. I couldn't feel my legs. Right. I just couldn't feel my legs. And I wasn't very good. And after the game, he's just come over to me as I'm sitting, and he's went, got his finger and he stuck it right in my face and he went don't you ever do that again he says if you don't want to play tell me you don't want to play but don't ever go on the field and perform like that ever again and then walked off and for a testimonial oh, a testimonial wow it was like that oh, you believe it yeah how did <sighs> you used to how, how did you used to handle it as a coach were you conscious would it depend on the player the way that you talk to them in front of the others or would you uh, Right. Yeah. Yeah, it completely depends on the situation. Completely depends right. on the situation. Frank? Um, the one I remember is, um, it came from Ruud Gullit when I was playing for Chelsea the first year. We went to Newcastle and the night before, um, Gianluca Vialli, Gianfranco Zola and myself, we had for a special day off on the Monday to go somewhere and uh, and he said, okay, no problem. You want to go, you know, no problem. So it was very nice, but we had an awful game. I think you showed to the to the old world, you know, my fantastic header to Alan Shearer when I wanted to yes. give the ball back to the, my goalkeeper. I think we lost three nil. We were awful. <laughs> and after we came back to the, to the dressing room and Gulli looked at us and said, oh, the three of you, because you take the piss out of me, you know, you're not going to go on Monday, I tell you. You're oh, going to wow. come back and you're going to train twice. Yeah, yeah, but we deserved it. We were awful and I was the, I was the worst, I have to say. And did you go back on the Monday in the end? Of course, of course. Right. You know, no, 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 we, we, the, Dutch, the Dutch is stubborn, so you right. have to stick to what he says. <laughs> there's, there's been plenty of times, Dan. There's been plenty of times down the years. I remember Peter Reid just won, but I'm sure the lads will have had it as well. When I was playing for Sunderland and we organised a night out in London, we played, I think it might have been Tottenham or West Ham, and we organised a night out in London and we got absolutely battered, three or four nil, and then Peter Reid said to everyone that was staying down, no chance you are staying down, get yourself back in the coach, all the way back to Sunderland. 
Oh, like naughty kids. Yeah, exactly. Oh my goodness. Uh, that is it. Thank you very much, guys. Stay out of trouble this weekend. Just a reminder, ESPN FC with you every single day. A bit more uh, Oculus tonight, Steve? I might have another go, right? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> welcome. Welcome. Good luck. Welcome.